by the time a rotation is over, it's almost like we don't want to go out in the box anymore. I mean, you get whacked three or four times a day. That's well, you know, we 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 are pretty good at what we do, and uh, to get to get shot up pretty regular doesn't do a whole lot for your ego. Today, these choppers fly in mock battle, playing at war. But for thousands of such machines, the past is anything but a bloodless affair. I don't know about this one, but you know, you do wonder who, who sat in here, and you wonder where they are now, what they're doing now. Would they be surprised if they knew that what the aircraft was doing now? A lot of legacy to a piece of equipment like this that, that we're not even aware of, you wonder. You wonder. At the United Nations, the Security Council was presented with a resolution calling for the immediate and unconditional withdrawal of all foreign troops from Afghanistan. For the Russians, this was not an invasion, just a helping hand to a nation in need. December 1979, two Soviet mechanized divisions enter Afghanistan. The socialist puppet state there is under siege by Mujahideen from the nation's seven Islamic tribes. Afghans incensed by a communist-imposed ideology that denies the existence of God. Moscow is fearful that the rising tide of Islamic fundamentalism is rising too close to the empire's southern border. This will be the first real test of Russian arms since the Second World War. Suddenly seeing all these young conscripts out on the air base, and they were all 18, 19, 20 years old, they were all trying to grow moustaches, and in a sense, this is like Vietnam déjà vu. In the early years, Afghanistan is a shadow war left unreported in the Soviet media. In the early 80s, if you thumb through magazines and newspapers that were covering the war in Afghanistan, basically you get it, an impression that Soviet soldiers in Afghanistan were raising flowers or picking flowers or constructing schools or kindergartens, and nothing else. We were briefed by the colonel who was still had the Af Afghan Afghanistan dust on his shoulders. He just, he told us, guys, I don't care what the hell did they tell you in Moscow. Now, let's talk about real situation. By late 1980, over 100,000 Soviets are fighting and dying in Afghanistan. But when the bodies of the dead return home, families are told that their sons and brothers have died in training accidents. Throughout the war, the Soviets control Afghanistan's few cities. The guerrilla army owns the surrounding countryside. They call themselves Mujahideen, which means fighters of God. The region is mountainous. Much of the country sits above 10,000 feet. In attempts to project power beyond the cities, the Soviets scatter fire bases across the land. Supply and reinforcement are difficult. Afghanistan's deep gorges and narrow mountain passes prove a nightmare to Moscow's conventional army. Soviet convoys find themselves under constant threat of sudden ambush by an enemy that then disappears into thin air. this rugged setting, the Red Army comes to rely more heavily on one machine than any other, 
Like the American conflict in Vietnam, Afghanistan is a helicopter war. And like the Huey helicopter in Vietnam, one aircraft comes to embody the Soviet struggle there. The Mi-24D is powered by twin turbine 2200 horsepower engines. Its combat range is almost 500 miles. The gunner sits in the front seat and the pilot in the rear. The transport compartment can carry eight troopers, but is most often used to store extra ordnance. The stub wings add 25% more lift in high-speed flight, reduce the chopper's turning radius, and can be hung with four 32-shot rocket pods. In front, the hind wields a four-barreled 12.7-millimeter Gatling gun. Over time, the Mi-24 evolves into a pure attack gunship. It seldom carries troops, except in an emergency. Usually, it is left to Mi-17s and Mi-8s to pull the men on the ground out of danger. You are in trouble, and if he's not getting you out of there, that's the end of it. And even when you're on board, you just hold your breath and count all along seconds before you feel that the altitude and probably the distance is long enough so you can slowly exhale and relax. In many ways, the Mi-24 is a product of the American experience in Vietnam. U.S. Army studies following the war in Southeast Asia determined America's Huey helicopter, both underpowered and extremely vulnerable to enemy fire. In the early 1970s, Soviet designers sifted through these studies and took them to heart. The result, an exceptionally fast machine that is nearly impervious to 50 caliber machine gun fire. And that was really something dreadful. And then you will fire on it, and uh, it will have no, no effect. You could see that sparking of hitting it and getting uh, sparks, and still it will come at you. I literally love it because uh, more than once it uh, uh, saved my life and it was hit with uh, bullets and shells all, all around and uh, still, uh, well, it uh, carried my, my body <laughs> back to the base. Soviet tactics often replicate the hammer and anvil operations used by American forces in Vietnam. Hours prior to a hind assault on a suspect village, Soviet troops are inserted into hidden positions along the villagers' most likely path of escape. The hinds would pop up from behind the mountain peak with the sun rising and the winds blowing into their direction. And this is like a this is like a, here comes the nightmare. You, you could scare, you, you, uh, you know, even Afghan Mujahideen, they were very brave. They were very good fighters. They didn't care even if they're dead or alive, you know. But you can see that feeling everyone, that the way the helicopter was coming to you, it's, uh, you, you can get that feeling like, oh, it's something coming to me, you know. When they flee the incoming choppers, it is the Afghans who are ambushed as they stumble headlong into Red Army paratroopers lying in wait. Hello. 